Are you looking to get more done in less time? Or maybe to improve your professional image? Or to get better results from your business writing? Welcome to Professional Writing Skills, part of the Write It Well Academy. Write It Well has been people helping people in business for 35 years. We help clients and individuals with trainings on site and online, coaching engagements, different kinds of writing, editing, and consulting services, and an entire series of published workbooks available from major retailers. All of them are designed to help you improve your business communication at work. Our focus is to save you time as you drive, draft documents. We'll help you with every email, resume, cover letter you write, report, proposal, or procedure, professional presentation, or other kinds of business documents. Professional writing skills is also embedded in this academy. The course follows the content from this book. More exercises and activities can be found in the printed and downloadable version of professional writing skills. It offers a five-step planning process to help you write any document to anyone. It also will include tips and tools for sentence level strategies, including effective grammar, uh, clear and concise language, and other sentence level challenges that business people on all levels struggle with. But what do you struggle with? Take a piece of paper and write down a few things that you find challenging about writing for work. Some people have trouble organizing their main idea or the points they'd like to present. Some people struggle to determine who's the right audience for their message, how much detail or how little detail should be included. Or some people struggle on a sentence level with grammar and punctuation issues. Write down a few things that you find challenging about writing for work and keep that list handy. But what kind of documents do you write at work? That's important to consider as well. Do you write memos, formal letters, a lot of email, reports, proposals, presentations, performance reviews, memos, content for different kinds of templates, different online forms, maybe meeting minutes, bulletins, newsletters, we write a lot at work, and our writing is exposed to larger audiences through electronic communication. So it's important to take time to focus on setting our best, putting our best foot forward. Our objectives for today are to help you get to the point quickly, proofread accurately, develop clear and concise paragraphs, as well as write concisely, clearly and directly, and when appropriate, to write persuasively. So let's think about these objectives in the context of the documents that you write for work. Our agenda today is broken into two parts. The agenda for part one will cover these topics. The criteria for effective business writing, a five-step planning process that we'll walk through and you can adapt for your own needs. The components of a first draft, including openings, closings, and lists. The agenda for part two includes active language, specific language, and plain English. Eliminating clutter, cons considering sentence structure, punctuation, and grammar, and editing and proofreading your writing. By focusing on all of these components, you can improve your professional image and get more done in less time. Let's start with the criteria for professional writing. In everything that you write, it's important to state the main point clearly at the beginning of your message. Unlike academic writing, the main point always goes first in business writing. The second criteria is to organize the information logically. We're required in business to leave out unnecessary information. We should use short sentences and paragraphs, eliminate unnecessary words, 
include all the necessary information. Why? So readers don't come back to you immediately with questions you haven't considered originally. Use active, precise language in plain English and use correct grammar, punctuation, and spelling. In part one of this section, we're going to talk about these criteria in more detail. We'll walk through a five-step planning process and then we'll get into our first draft, openings, closings, and lists. Let's start with writing a plan, developing a plan in five steps. This is a chart we took from some research that was conducted after interviews with professional writers. The question was, how much, how do you allocate your time when you're writing something important? They said, well, we spend about 5% of our time thinking about our readers, so really understanding our audience. We spend another 5% determining our purpose, the purpose for the communication. Next, it's 5% identifying the main point. 20% of the time is spent then on selecting the information to include. If you're a, a reporter, you might be going out and doing research at that point. If you're inside your organization planning a message, you might be gathering that information or doing assessments or reading, doing primary research, asking other people, formulating your thoughts. All of that is part of selecting the information. And the next piece is organizing that information. That's also 20% of a professional writer's job. Now, let's do some quick math. If we add it all up on the, above the line, we have 55%. Well, that's interesting. 55% of their time is spent thinking about the writing, planning the writing, but not writing yet. 55%. So then the other 45% is spent writing a quick first draft, that's 20%, revising and editing another 20%, and then proofing and correcting 5%. So 45% of their time is spent writing, whereas the, the larger portion, 55%, is on planning. So what does that tell us? It tells us that planning is very important to writing. So for clear and effective communication, you need to spend time planning your message before you write. We like to say it's like money in the bank. You can save more time if you put some money and time away, save it for a rainy day, okay? So your time is well spent on planning in writing. Some more benefits of planning, you'll find mi fewer miscommunications, less time spent clarifying, less time spent rewriting, a more positive professional image, getting the results you need and seizing opportunities. Okay, again, it's like money in the bank. The benefits of planning will pay off. In fact, we did a, um, a research project. We did a survey at Write It Well, and we asked people what happens when you receive unclear or confusing communication from people. And 85% of them said that they form a negative impression of the reader and of his or her organization. So really, this benefit of planning is a benefit to you professionally as well as to your organization and its business goals. So let's jump into our planning process and decode those five important steps so that you can replicate this planning process anytime you write anything important to anyone. All right, so the first step is to look at your, what you're writing from the reader's point of view. We've got some binoculars here which show the point of really thinking about who your reader is, what do they care about. Okay, so sit down as you are now and focus on the next important message that you need to write to somebody. Who is your reader? Really imagine them on the other side of the email communication or reading your report in printed form or seeing it on their screen. Really think about that reader. Visualize them. Okay, so ask some questions. Are they expecting to hear from you? Are they familiar with this subject? Or maybe they're a subject matter expert. Are they interested in what you have to say? Are, are they likely to consider you an authority? Or from, are they familiar with your views? Are they committed to your point of view, likely to agree? Are they likely to find the message uncomfortable? 
Okay, so some other questions again, are they, are you writing, we're gonna get into step two pretty quickly, so you're gonna think about your purpose, but before you can think about step two, you really need to go back and understand your reader and what they care about. We like to say that your reader is only listening to one radio station, which is WIIFM. It's an acronym that stands for What's In It For Me. Kind of silly, agreed, but important to think about what your reader cares about. We want to change the whole paradigm of communication here. So instead of telling people what you want to tell them, you want to tell them what they actually want to hear and what they need to do to get their job done. Okay, so once you've decided, once you've thought about your reader and what they care about, the second step is to think about your primary purpose. Here at Write It Well, we use a decision tree, and it's called informing or influencing. And we like to say that they have, you always have one primary purpose for writing. You're either writing to influence somebody to do something or inform them about something. So let's break that down a bit. If you're writing to influence, your primary purpose is to persuade readers to do something. In other words, you're hoping they will take some action. If you're writing to inform, your primary purpose is to answer readers' questions about a subject so they can be informed or make a decision. The implicit statement here is that they're going to make a decision at some point or they need the information to be informed. If you need readers to do something right away or in a precise time frame, you are writing to influence or writing also known as writing to persuade. We use those words interchangeably, writing to influence and writing to persuade. Now sometimes th people think that there's something negative about writing to influence or writing to persuade. Not necessarily true. The important thing is to know what your purpose is. The negative thing actually is when you don't know what your purpose is and you send confusing messages that make the reader work too hard to understand your main point or your purpose. So if you're doing a good job, you're very clear about what your purpose of your communication is. Okay, so go back and think about your example. Are you writing to tell somebody that they should do something or simply exchanging information and expecting them to read it but not respond, all right? So think about your purpose for the message that you need to write next, okay? So maybe you're writing to persuade somebody to correct a problem, to clarify something that's confusing, to send you something, or to take some other action. If you're writing to inform them, you're just telling them the facts. Uh, not just, it might be very important facts, but you're sharing facts. You're letting them know the consequences of some actions or failures to act. You're offering a solution to a problem, or it might be another topic, okay? But you're giving them some information. You're not expecting them to take immediate action. You're sharing information. So imagine they read your email, they, small, they minimize it, they move on if you're informing them. When you're asking them to do something, they're turning into the reply and they're getting back to you and giving you the information you need. So, so let's look at some real life examples. You've already got one that you're formulating um, for yourself, but here's an example. It's from Michael Bellows. It's to Diane Anderson and the subject is the annual sales conference. And uh, Michael says, I would like you to consider moving this year's sales conference to the Horizons Resort in Marina. Horizons has all the facilities we need as and offered us an excellent package. I've enclosed details. Marina is centrally located and is served by all the major airlines. If we sign a contract by January 15th, Horizons will give us an additional 10% discount. Please let me know if you need more information. I'd like to confirm conference plans by the end of next week, well before the holiday break and there's assuming, we assume that there's a closing there as well. All right, so let's say that this is, we're probably writing to influence somebody to take some action here, right? We wanna see some action. Um, but hey, let's look at this example, okay? From Eileen Magugio, and she's writing to uh, George Blocker, and the subject is a three week, th excuse me, three shift coverage in processing. 
For the last several weeks, we've been provided with three shift coverage in the processing department. Um, company employees have covered the day shift and swing shift. A temporary employee has been covering the night shift. A third shift was covered on a trial basis and it's scheduled to end this week. This arrangement has been satisfactory and we should continue it, okay? But now we're writing in a different way. We've changed our purpose. Originally, we were just giving information. Now, we're offering some suggestions. We want somebody to do something, so read it this way. Eileen says to George, please confirm arrangements for shift coverage, okay? I recommend that we continue our three shift coverage. Please let me know what you decide. The coverage has been working out very well in the processing department. Okay, so this person has thought clearly about their, their main purpose for writing and they've thought, if I just give information, I may not get the results I need and it's appropriate for me to write here to persuade somebody, to influence them to do something. So my main point is gonna be stated very clearly at the beginning, I recommend that we continue. Okay, so Eileen has gone on to say, We've met all the deadlines and made the most efficient use of employees' time. That's because we've had company employees cover the day shift and swing shifts and hired a temporary employee. Thanks if you can let me know this week if we continue this can continue this arrangement. Okay, so very clearly stated. By the way, if you tell somebody to do something in the form of persuasive or influential writing, they're generally going to ask you why. So your job isn't just to tell them what you think should be done, your job is to tell them why they should do what you're suggesting they do. So we don't get off the hook by just saying, I re recommend that we continue, right? The question's always gonna be why, right? Our readers are not easily influenced, but we do wanna tell them clearly what we think they should be doing. Okay, so here's another example, all right? Now here we're persuading again the reader to address the meeting. Um, dear Miss Layton, we suspect you're very busy, but we would be delighted if you'd agree to be uh, the keynote speaker in early October at the first meeting of the new Glendale Climbers Club. Please let us know if you'd be available. Our members would be happy to hear. You take a minute and read the rest, but generally, what are readers doing, by the way? Our readers are skimming. They're skimming the beginning of a message to see what the most important message is. So be clear at the beginning of every message. Are you writing to persuade or writing to inform? Otherwise known as influence or inform. What is your most important purpose, okay? And if you're just writing to inform, be clear about that. We will hold our first meeting on Thursday and our keynote speaker will be. Do you notice the difference here? Previously, we said, please join us. We'd like you and here's why. And here we're simply sharing information about the meeting. Okay, so remember the first step in our planning process was around thinking about our reader. How busy are they? How are they gonna read the message? What information are they interested in hearing from you? Our second step in the planning process is to be clear about our purpose. Are you writing to inform or writing to influence? So now I'm going to address your, your question, which usually when we work with groups on site, I get a question like, well, actually, I'm trying to do both. And so remember when I said you have a primary purpose. Um, it's very difficult to do two things really well. So our suggestion to you is consider your most, your, your primary purpose for writing. So you may have a secondary purpose. Oftentimes if you're writing a press release, for example, your primary purpose is to either influence or inform, but they're, they're pretty closely linked, informing and influencing, again, with press releases. But in the course of normal business communication or what we consider to be everyday business communication, you can, if you work hard, determine a primary purpose, which is either to inform or to influence, right? Um, it's hard to do two things really well at the same time. Pick a primary purpose. You may have a secondary purpose. Okay, so once you've followed steps one and step two in our planning process, we're gonna move on to step three, which is to compose a key sentence that delivers your most important message. 
Okay, so what is your most important message? Here's uh, document A, and as you can imagine, document B is next, but let's take a look at document A from Mr. Weller. Safety is our number one concern, and our safety record shows that we're all trained well. There's a lot of traffic on the block of Jefferson Street between South Main and Mission. The street sees heavy traffic very regularly, yet its current condition is a safety hazard. The street should probably be widened. That would have tremendous benefits and we'd certainly get the job done. A night permit would allow us to start right away. Hmm, if I'm reading this, I'm probably reading through it, but I might have missed the most important message because where, where is it? Where is that most important message? Okay, so here it is written much more clearly. I'm writing to ask you to give my construction company a noise permit and allow night work on the block of Jefferson Street between Grand Avenue and South Main. The street sees heavy traffic very regularly, yet its current condition is a safety hazard. Widening the street would have tremendous benefits and we're ready to work day and night to make the necessary repairs. We hope to begin work as soon as possible. If you have any questions, please call me at my office. All right, so we've been very clear here about the most important message, and we've put it right up front at the beginning of the message. I mentioned early on that academic writing and business writing are different. Don't forget, in when we were in school, we oftentimes were required to write 13 pages, and our main point, our most important point, was the conclusion, and it was at the end of the 13 pages. But in business writing, people are not reading every word, I like to say, are they? Do you imagine people curled up on the couch, sipping hot cocoa and lingering over every word of your writing? Probably not. They're skimming and scanning, looking for the most important message. That's why our job is to put it up front at the very beginning. Okay, so again, we've highlighted the most important message and there it is up front here at the beginning. So again, if we're writing to persuade, we're suggesting that our readers do something like, please approve the plan. All right, we need to get the expansion project. We hope to include a gym at the new facility. And if we're writing to inform, we want our reader to know something. Okay, so the point I'm, uh, th this is how we write our most important message based again on whether we're writing to persuade or writing to inform. The project I'm coordinating will be finished by May 19th, or I'm sorry to tell you that your application has been denied, and so on. All right, so keep your main point in context of you, the purpose for writing. Steps four and five are an important part of the planning process as well. We're gonna list the facts and ideas for our message and we're gonna group them into categories. If your email is only one sentence long, of course you wouldn't move on to steps four and five. But when our messages are complex or include lots of ideas that we wanna convey, it's really important to make sure we've covered all of them and we've presented them in a logical way, okay? So once we've already thought about our reader and our purpose for writing, we've gotten clarity around our most important message, we're gonna then go through a brainstorming activity of listing all the facts and ideas and grouping them into categories. So let's look at a simple example that everyone can relate to. Um, here's a phone number. Now, there's a simple way of grouping this idea, this, this phone number, so that it's easier for any sort of reader or viewer to understand, right? We would first start with the area code and then the prefix and then the number. So it's the same thing for writing. We just have to make sure we offer some natural breaks and categories and that we've grouped our facts and ideas into categories that make it easy for the reader to understand. Okay, so here's another example of some ideas that, ha that have grouped one way um, group A here includes hammers, nails, and paint. And in group B, we have paperclip, staples, and whiteout. All right, so, so what's group A here? Group A might be uh, construction supplies, and group B might be office supplies. And there's no right and wrong way to group them, but there's lots of different ways to group them, right? So maybe we could group them as group C and D instead. And so here in group C, we've rearranged things. So paint and whiteout 
are in one group, whereas all the other tools that are not liquid, hammers, nails, paper clips, and staples, are in a different group. And we can call those group C and group D whatever kind of category or whatever kind of group identifying agent we want to use. The important thing is not how we group them. The important point is that we've taken the time to group our ideas and organize them in a logical way. Why? Because it's much more rational and easier for the reader to follow. So there's different ways, again, to organize your ideas. You may choose different topics for organizing. So you may organize based on cost or ease of use or time frame or a different kind of feature. Here's, here's another example for organizing schemes, right? It might be um, first year, a scheme might be the first, scheme one might be the first year, second year, third year, or scheme two might be past, present, or future. You know, again, the most important point is that you take ways to categorize. Other ideas might be the pros and cons. That's really one that people can fall back on all the time. Again, disadvantages or advantages meets or fails to meet our criteria. These are great ways to organize the content and group it in ways that are helpful for the reader. So here's you know, one that we can do together, essentially. How are these facts able, how could we group these ideas? Let's say, you know, these, these, all these different sport activities need to be grouped in different ways. So surfing, skiing, windsurfing, snowboarding. How might we group those? Um, we could group them by water-related or non-water-related. In workshops, I've heard lots of people come up with lots of different ideas. So um, sports that need a ball and others that do not need a ball. Um, winter sports and summer sports or seasonal sports. Um, expensive sports, less expensive sports. Um, there's lots of different ways to organize, but I think that you and I will agree that it's important to take the time to organize our ideas. Again, um, other ways of organizing this might be little or no cost, moderately expensive and expensive. So take a moment and think about the email or the document that you started think the, when you identified your reader and your purpose, your main point. What are all the facts and ideas that reader needs to know? If you're persuading somebody to do something, you might tell them, I think we should adopt this new process for ordering supplies. Then think about all your reader's questions. They're going to be asking about, well, how do we implement this? And how does the ordering work? And how do we communicate this new process? And what's the budget around this process? And who gets to decide? And what things are included? And you want to do a really great job of brainstorming all your facts and ideas and then organizing them into logical categories so that anyone can follow your most important point. Okay? The idea is to get results with your writing to make sure that the time that you spend communicating achieves the results you need. So we're going to talk in a bit about tone and how you present a professional message. So we're not telling people immediately, just do what I tell you to do. We're going to add all of the softening language like the please and the thank you and the salutation. We'll get to that. But it's important to um, own a planning process before you jump into lesson two, which is our planning, our writing the first draft, that you own this planning process, adapt it to your needs, but you've thought through all the components. This is an important step in the journey of presenting a professional image to your reader.